Before the season started, I was asked what I was most looking forward to in Brian Kelly's first year. And I said, no bullshit. I was looking forward to no bullshit. No uh, nefarious activities, uh, no BS on the sidelines, not perfection. I'm not asking for perfection, just no bullshit. No outdated schemes, no coordinators fighting, no dumb fuck clock management moments, and no unorganized recruiting days. No unorganized recruiting period. Not losing any recruits. That happens all the time. You lose recruits, guys flip. It happened today. Just, I don't want any unforeseen drama. I don't want the rug being pulled from underneath you. Being left at the altar with no backup plan, Ed Ogeron. I don't want any of that. And today, that didn't happen. Today was a little boring. Today was no real drama. No drama BK. See, sometimes being good means you're going to be a little boring. I mean, think about Alabama's dynasty under Nick Saban. A little little boring, right? Not just because most of the time they were run the ball, play defense, but it's more of just the fact that you know exactly what you're going to get every single time because they're good. And not just sports, just think about anything, being good at anything. Think about your favorite restaurants, your favorite takeout places. They serve the same two or three foods, and you get the same two things every single time. But you keep going. Think about your favorite actors and all the movies you watch. Liam Neeson, he's saving someone from a train or a plane in every single movie, and Tom Cruise is always jumping out of a plane or a train and surviving in every single damn movie. But you keep going. Think about the happiest couples you know. They like to go on the same vacations every single year. They have a routine, but they're happy with it. All these things that I mentioned are known as being good, but it pays to be good. It means you might get a little bit boring at the same time, but I say that's a good trade-off. And this is something that I just realized this morning about LSU. LSU has 25 commits that have signed today, 25. Do you realize that they had 23 before the season started. 23 before the season started. Now, two of them kind of switched. One of them flipped. They added a new guy. But before the season started, 22 or 23 commits before they even played Florida State. After they played Florida State. After they lost it to Tennessee. Most of them stayed. You only added two new ones. Most of them stayed. Most of them made up their minds. Most of them had relationships with Brian Kelly and LSU. Had built-in trust in the staff before they saw one single snap played under the Brian Kelly era. Everything stayed the course. Everything was steady. See, anytime there was going to be a decommitment from a player, we knew about it weeks in advance. Hell, if not months in advance. No surprises. None. Jalen Austin, the cornerback from uh, California, from Long Beach, he flipped to Oregon today. We heard about that the week before the Bama game. I remember. There were talks of that for over a month now. It's been over a month. No surprise. LSU had pretty much moved on, accepted that, and hell, they may get some guys that are better out of the transfer portal and one guy who's going to commit tomorrow. Maybe. We'll see. LSU flipped a four-star tight end. Uh, oh, God, I'm going to try to screw up his first name. Camorian Pimpton. I'm just calling him Pimpton. How about that? That's easier. We heard about that for weeks. No surprise. Built-in relationships. Things were moving in that direction. Built on substance. Built on communication. A little boring. You know, it'd be cooler if you, you know, probably a lot cooler if you just did a surprise flip at the last second with a guy that you never even heard of, weren't even keeping your eye on. Yeah, that'd be cool. That'd be cool too. But how much substance is there to that relationship, to that recruitment? See, this is what all LSU fans have wanted. For the first time since 2004, you can rest your head at night knowing you have a guy who has his shit together. You have a guy who's going to figure it out if the shit isn't all together. You can sleep well at night knowing that that's all going to be taken care of. I don't know about you, but I sleep better at night when I'm bored. 
Because bored means you're probably doing something right. Okay. We've talked about the theme of today. And no surprise, that's we got what we expected. It's what we all talked about uh, going into yesterday. We were, you know, a little iffy about it. But ultimately, that's what happened. Now, let's get to the nitty-gritty of the class. So, most recruiting sites have LSU with a top five class. whoop de frickin' do um, If you want to win a national championship, I say that you don't have to be in the top three. Everyone says you have to be in the top three. I always have said, if you be at least in the top eight. How about that? Be in the top eight. It means you're on track. Um, you don't have to be number one or number two or number three every single year like Bama or Georgia to win national titles. It's more uh, not just about accumulating the talent, which is important. It's more about, you know, how you manage the roster. Is it all balanced out position by position? Because injuries happen, transfers happen. Uh, are you developing the talent? Are you scouting that talent well? Just because you get a bunch of five stars doesn't mean it's going to work out. I mean, ask Texas. They've had plenty of five stars commit to them over the past several years, uh, past decades, but none of them have panned out whatsoever because they're scouting and developing the wrong five stars. So team rankings matter. Look, this will always be a a, a business of uh, talent acquisition. It's what it's always going to be. You have to just get that talent on campus, but don't let all the do-gooders on social media try to tell you, well, rankings don't matter. No, they do. It's just 50 or 60% of the battle. There are other things to it. There are, there are you know, 40%, 50% of other things you have to do. That's important. But that other 50 and 60% of getting the talent on campus is quite a lot. That's pretty damn important, too. So LSU has that box checked. Top five class, according to damn near every recruiting site. And if I may be petty for a moment, uh, Notre Dame, uh, their team rankings are now behind LSU in every single recruiting site. If you want to be petty, be sure to be patient. You can't be petty without being patient because it'll come back and bite you in the ass. And boy, we kept all the receipts. But now, I don't want to talk about Notre Dame anymore. Uh, let's break down this class bit by bit. So I said yesterday that what I like to do is I looked at I like to look at the substance of a class. All right, look. Rankings and all that stuff matter, but the issue that I had with guys like Ed Ogeron is that he was a star chaser, um, and there was a lot of bells and whistles. There wasn't necessarily a lot of substance to his entire class. And the substance test that I like to do is you take the top 10 recruits in your class, rank them, top 10, and if f at least five out of the 10 are on the line of scrimmage... You have passed the Nick Diaz substance test. LSU has passed that test. Five of their top ten, especially I think two uh, of their top three, are all on the line of scrimmage. Offensive line or defensive line. LSU has passed that test. Uh, that's not something I came up with. That's just general knowledge of football. Win the line of scrimmage, you win championships. Uh, so rounding out the high school signees overall position by position, it's all pretty balanced. As well, that's another test you have to pass. Do you have balance at most positions, especially positions of need? High school signees, and there will be tr more coming and there will be transfers, but high school signees, position by position, three safeties, three cornerbacks, there could be one more coming, two linebackers, three defensive linemen, four offensive linemen, four wide receivers, two running backs, three tight ends, and one quarterback but while that's all balanced out and that's generally kind of the rule of thumb you want four or five offensive linemen per recruiting class per year uh defensive linemen still a little bit low for me but again they have a february signing period and they have the transfer portal now uh it's all balanced out but let's break this freshman class down into four categories all right categories of how impactful will they be because some of you are not are going to want to know, all right, well, who's the best guy? Who's going to play immediately? Who's going to have to play immediately? Uh, where are positions of need being filled? Uh, that transfer portal right now is just not going to help you. Breaking this class down into four categories, let's start with the first category. One 
is the immediate impact guys. These are the guys who are big-time players, big-time recruits, who are either A, going to leapfrog some of the starters that are already on campus, or are at positions of need where they have no choice and probably will be very, very good and very impactful. Think Harold Perkins, think Will Campbell, uh, think those guys. So the first one would be Shelton Sampson, the second one would be Zalance Hurd, and the third one, Deshaun Womack. So wide receiver Shelton Sampson, I would say he's least likely to be most impactful. Not because he's not great or wouldn't be impactful, it's just you have so many returning starters at wide receiver. Uh, you added Aaron Anderson in the transfer portal to top that top it off. I mean, think about it. Jack Besh left because of playing time, and he was the second leading wide receiver in 2021. So it's not that Shelton Sampson isn't going to be impactful. It's just he's less likely out of these three guys to be very impactful. These are your top three recruits, simply because of guys you have coming in. Uh, the second... Um, most impactful player, or second least impactful player, however you want to look at it, is offensive tackle Zalance Hurd. Mostly because offensive linemen, you have your entire offensive line coming back. And also, it's very unusual. Again, Will Campbell and Emory Jones are the exception, but it was also out of necessity. They had their struggles. But also, at the same time, even though you have all of your offensive line starting, coming back, offensive linemen do get hurt. There's always going to be attrition every single year, every single offseason, fall camp, spring camp at the offensive line position. So you're going to have a rotation where he's going to come in, I guarantee you, one of those games where he's going to have to be a starter. You also have to consider, as Lance heard, starting at one of the tackle spots, specifically right tackle, because Emory Jones, who played and started right tackle all but two games during the season, He's actually a guard at his natural position. Uh, LSU had to rotate some guys at guard. Uh, they needed Emory Jones to play tackle because they didn't have anybody else that was good enough to do it. He was. Well, as Lance Hurd coming in may make that interesting. So he's second on the list. The third most impactful guy, or uh, the most impactful guy out of the three, is defensive end Deshaun Womack out of Baltimore, Maryland. He is going to be the most impactful freshman day one. Would not shock me if he's a day one starter. Matter of fact, I think that's what they sold him on, and I think that's ultimately what he will be. Because B.J. Ogilary is gone, and you have depth concerns at that position. But he could be day one most impactful. And also, not to mention, uh, he's probably LSU's best freshman overall when you look at certain recruiting sites. It's either him or a Lance Hurd. So that's the first category. The second category is guys who may play as freshmen, who may play as freshmen, but won't be necessarily as impactful or may go through a lot of freshman lumps. Think of Mason Taylor. Uh, he was a highly recruited tight end, one of the best tight ends in the country, but he wasn't this five-star slam dunk kind of guy, and he struggled the first half of the season, but you had nobody else to play, so you played him. That's this category. Those guys are Toviano, the cornerback from Texas, Mac Markway, the tight end from St. Louis, Missouri, Pimpton, tight end from Texas, you just flipped from Vanderbilt, Jackson Howard, the defensive end from Minnesota, Whit Weeks, the linebacker from Georgia, as Wes's brother, Caleb Jackson and Trey Holly, the two running backs from Louisiana. Uh, Toviano, um, I'm putting him in there uh, regardless of what Desmond Ricks does tomorrow. Uh, but I would still put Desmond Ricks in that position. People would think, why not put Desmond Ricks in one of the top ones if he were in? Well, because Desmond Ricks is still got some weight to put on him, and also he's graduating from high school early, so he really is a junior at 17 years old coming onto a college campus. He's going to have some freshman struggles. Uh, so that's why I would put him at number two, but Toviano and him would basically be in that spot. Also, Denver Harris situation is kind of a waiting game, but even if Denver Harris and Desmond Ricks do come, I still put Toviano in number two because you're, he's still probably going to play. Matt Markway and Pimpton, the tight ends, um, well, they're just going to play because they have to, and there's no one else to play next to Mason Taylor, uh, so that's why. Jackson Howard, the defensive end from Minnesota, from Minneapolis area. Again, Ali Gay is gone, although they did get a transfer uh, that I will talk about later in the show that may fill in that starting spot. But 
Also, numbers. They don't have enough numbers right now, so I would imagine Jackson Howard does get some rotational time and playing time at that Ollie Gay defensive spot, maybe. Whit Weeks, linebacker, he'll be in the rotation. Probably he's better than his brother, and his brother was in the rotation this year, so he's one of those guys. And then, of course, Caleb Jackson, Trey Holly at running back. You may be surprised by that because I think all of LSU's running backs are pretty much coming back next year. But here's the thing. LSU is not necessarily pleased with the running backs on their depth chart. Noah Kane kind of lacks explosion. He's he's honest, but he lacks explosion. Um, John Emery lacks reliability. Now he's going to be very explosive. You can't keep him off the field, but he still lacks reliability until he proves me otherwise. And Josh Williams, without a doubt, is your most reliable back, your best running back this season. And Armani Goodwin is has some injury problems for the second year in, the, in a row. Now, Josh Williams, I think, right now has proven to be your most reliable best back because of uh, Armani Goodwin still having injury concerns. But they don't want to beat Josh Williams to death. So because of that, Caleb Jackson, Trey Holly, they may step up and get into that running back rotation, which is something that... We know Frank Wilson loves to do. He loves to play multiple backs in a game when he has them. And he'll have them for next year. That's the second category. Let's move on to the third category. We got four. These are good players, similar to the second category, guys who are like Mason Taylors, uh, guys who are, you know, are freshmen who won't be as impactful but will you know start and play. But these players, because of the positions that they play, because of where they're located probably will sit for a year or two and we'll get to sit back and learn and not have to be thrust in into the fire as true freshmen. Those players are offensive lineman DJ Chester from Georgia, Tyree Adams from New Orleans, St. Aug, wide receivers Jalen Brown from Miami, and Kyle Parker from Texas. Safety Kylan Jackson from Zachary. I put him in that as well. And also safety Ryan Yates from Texas. Those two. And lastly, of course, quarterback Ricky Collins, a really good player. Uh, if you put him in as a true freshman, he could probably hold water, but um, you don't want them to, and you don't need them to, and that's why they're in the good players who are going to sit for a year or two or more before they actually start impacting your team. And the fourth one, these are your projects. They may pop, they may not. Who the hell knows? But you took a chance on them, you like something you see in them, Recruiting rankings are a little bit down on them for one reason or the other. Their size, their competition, um, late bloomers, guys who just started playing football, what have you. But these are the projects that LSU has taken on. Tight end Jackson McGugan. I don't know if I'm saying his name correctly, but the tight end from Ohio that decommitted from Cincinnati. Wide receiver Kai Preen from St. James Parish. Defensive end Dylan Carpenter from Santa Maw. Safety, Ashton Stamps. He can kind of play safety or corner uh, out of uh, Archbishop Rummel and uh, Enola and Metairie. And Michael Doty, Georgia, safety as well. Cornerback, Jermaine Hughes out of Las Vegas. Guy has just started playing corner, I think, a year or two ago, so he's still learning the position, but very athletic. Offensive lineman, Paul Mabunga out of Georgia. And linebacker from Texas, Christian Braithwaite. He, he's the guy who was committed to Baylor and Dave Aranda. LSU flipped him. Those are your projects. That's where we have it all. Now, I will tell you who I like the most out of each group. Uh, the first group, and again, this is not short-term. This is more long-term, like who I think projects to be the higher draft pick, the guy who's going to end up being the best player, have the best career. Long-term, out of the first group, I would say Zalance Hurd. I could go to Sean uh, Womack either way, but I'm privy to those Louisiana guys, so I'll go with the Zalance Herd. I like his attitude. I like his bravado, all that stuff. The second group, eh, again, we're assuming Ricks is coming to LSU, then I would pick Desmond Ricks. But as of right now, he's not. So as of right now, I would say it's kind of a coin flip between Pimpton and Whit Weeks, maybe. Yeah, Pimpton and Whit Weeks. Um... Brian Kelly did say today, and we'll talk about some of Brian Kelly's comments because he had a press conference at two. He did say that Pimpton was arguably the most athletic tight end, I'm paraphrasing, the most athletic tight end that he's ever seen. 
of all the tight ends that he had. As far as tools and abilities, measurables, uh, he was the most athletic. I think I'll put Pimpton in that category over Whit Weeks. The third one, DJ Chester, offensive lineman. Um, just because, because he's highly rated. I do have a bit of a soft spot for Kyle Parker, the wide receiver out of Texas. He was a three-star. He bumped up to a four-star. I watch his stuff. He is vastly underrated. But again, I just kind of have to go with who's coaching who, uh, what's harder to evaluate, offensive linemen or wide receivers. Typically, wide receivers are harder to evaluate these days because of the rules. So I'll go uh, in the third group, DJ Chester. The fourth group may shock some of you. I'll go Paul Mabunga, the offensive lineman. He's a soccer player. Parents were immigrants from, uh, oh God, somewhere in Africa. I I forget. His parents are immigrants. Just started playing football, I think, two or three years ago. Soccer player. um, Guy who's going to put on weight. Georgia really wanted him. He was kind of the diamond in the rough that everybody in the SEC wanted out of the state of Georgia. So I'm going to roll with him. I love his film. But yeah, uh, out out of all those categories... Those who are.